Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us online for this Henley and Partners Global webcast on their recently launched and inaugural BRICS Wealth Report. My name is Juliette Foster and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel of experts. They're going to be with us for about an hour. They have their work cut out for them in that time because what they're going to do is to help us unpack the private wealth held in the newly expanded BRICS cohort of leading emerging market nations and at the same time they're also going to explore the new opportunities that have arisen, not just for investors, but also entrepreneurs and talented high net worth individuals. So plenty for us to get through in our time together. Let's start, though, by meeting our panel. First up, I'd like to welcome Dominic Volek. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's the group head of private clients at Henley and Partners, and he's based in Dubai. Dominic, it's very good to see you. How are you? Very well. Thanks, Juliet, and a pleasure to join everyone. Thank you so much. Let's move on now to our next panelist, Sunita Singh Dalal. Now, she is the partner of Private Wealth and Family Offices at Hurani and Partners, also based in Dubai. So you and Dominic are near neighbours. <laughs> yes, indeed. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Let me also extend the welcome to Dr. Jose Caballero, who's the Senior Economist at the IMD World Competitiveness Centre in Lausanne in Switzerland. Welcome. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Fantastic. Uh, it's good to see you. Next up, we have Dr. Robert Mogulnicki. Now, he is the Senior Resident Scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute and Adjunct Professor at Georgetown University in Washington. Now, it really is a pleasure to see you because I understand it's the early hours of the morning where you are. Yeah, but it's worthwhile to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Andrew Amoyles, who's the Head of Research at New World Wealth in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's good to see you. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me on. OK, it's an absolute pleasure. But what I want to do is to also thank all of you for being part of this conversation, because I know that you're very, very busy. So we appreciate the fact that you have put aside your time for us. Now, we're going to kick off with a presentation and Dominic is going to provide that. What he's going to do is give a short but very detailed overview of the key takeouts from that groundbreaking BRICS Wealth Report. So I'm going to give you five minutes, Dominic, but obviously because time is very tight, I'm also going to, going, to, going to give you a warning when there is two minutes left on your presentation. But for now, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Perfect, thanks, Juliet. And I'll, I'll keep an eye on the time and, and try and get through as much as I can um, with the slides I have. So. Uh, earlier this year, I think I think a lot of you are aware we we had five new countries joining the BRICS block. Um, so now, alongside Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, uh, we have new members, uh, including African nations, Egypt and Ethiopia, as well as members from the Middle East, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. So this expanded group is, of course, increasing its share of global wealth. Um, it's challenging the world order and establishing itself as a powerful rival to the G7 and other international institutions. And so with this, uh, Henley and Partners was, was very pleased to release our inaugural BRICS Wealth Report, which features exclusive wealth data from global wealth intelligence firm, New World Wealth. Um, we're, 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 we're very pleased to have Andrew joining us to represent, and along with insightful commentaries from other leading uh, experts around the world, some of which are joining us on the panel today. So looking at the high level numbers, we see this new BRICS block uh, with a total investable wealth of 45 trillion US dollars, uh, consisting of 1.6 million millionaires, just under 5,000 centi millionaires and 549 BRICS billionaires. For the purpose of the report, wealth refers to an individual's investable wealth. So this includes only their liquid investable assets, which is mainly their listed uh, company holdings, cash holdings, and any debt-free residential property holdings. And these figures uh, that you see in the report also include people that are living in that BRICS uh, member state, so the, the residents of that country, uh, as generally we consider wealth to be a far better measure of the financial health of an economy than um, GDP. So on this slide, we see a further breakdown of these numbers and, and the wealth bracket populations per member state. 
Uh, no particular surprises, I think, in terms of the members leading the pack with, you know, in China and India. But the UAE certainly punching above its weight with the third highest millionaire population. And having been based in Dubai myself for the last three years, and some of my fellow members, uh, panel members, significantly longer than that, we have certainly seen an influx of wealthy individuals into the UAE over the last few years. Um, for those of you wondering about, you know, what these categories, you know, how we define these categories. So, of course, millionaires are, are high net worth individuals. Um, these are, are those individuals with investable wealth of at least a million US dollars or more. Centi-millionaires being those individuals with investable wealth of $100 million or more. And then, of course, billionaires are those with investable wealth of a billion or more. Analyzing the numbers even further at a city level, um, we see this dominated again by those in China and India with Beijing, Shanghai, and Mumbai uh, in the lead. And from the newest members joining BRICS this year, it's the UAE again that features prominently with both Dubai and Abu Dhabi in the top 10 wealthiest cities. Uh, in the last column on this slide, you will also see the wealth growth over the last decade within each city. And this really refers to the rise or drop in the number of millionaires resident in that city over a certain period in percentage terms. And so here, only Moscow uh, saw a decrease in the number of resident millionaires over the last 10 years. This slide looks forward at the decade ahead in terms of wealth per capita, uh, referring to the average wealth of a person each, in each country and shows that the 10 year forecast for each member state um, with Saudi Arabia and India expected to see the, growth, uh, the greatest growth in wealth, wealth per capita over the years ahead. Two minutes on your presentation. And finally, uh, Good timekeeping, I think. Uh, we have also analyzed these BRICS members according to their passport power and, and their, their ranking on the Henley Passport Index, which ranks all our passports according to our travel freedom, uh, the, the number of destinations to which your passport allows you visa-free access or, um, or access without prior government approval um, being required. So at the moment, as you can see, the majority of, of BRICS members do not rank particularly highly. Um, on the index and in terms of their passports travel freedom, other than the UAE and Brazil, um, which do have very strong passports from a travel perspective, but we do we do expect this also to change in the years ahead. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there, Juliette, and, and um, maybe we can come back to this point later on. I think we will, Dominic. That really was a very good presentation. And thank you so much as well for breaking down the wealth definitions, the millionaires, the, the, the billionaires. I think at some point they said within our lifetime, or one of these think tanks actually said that we will see trillionaires, certainly within the next few years to come. So it'll be interesting to see whether the trillionaires emerge in the BRICS state. But thank you for that great presentation. And also, before we get down to the heart of this discussion, an invitation to you, our online audience. We want you to be part of this conversation as well. So if there are any points that you want to put to the panel questions or observations then you can do so using the question and answer facility q and a on zoom and we will try to get through as many of those questions we as we can at the end of the panel discussion so let's get down to that very same discussion somebody has to draw the first straw the short straw i should say on the opening question and robert you'll be delighted to know that it is you but listen we heard that presentation from dominic so much there but the the key thing i guess is the deeper levels of engagement that we're seeing between the BRICS and Middle Eastern and North African countries. From your vantage point, would you say that that is a new development or does it continue a trend that was already in existence? Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I was um, just looking at the, 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 new, the new members, the list of new members, there's obviously a really strong concentration of Middle East and North African countries that are joining. So some observers who are relatively new to this area would look at that and say, wow, this is, you know, this is would be surprised by by that presence of, of countries from this region. Uh, but those of us who have been watching uh, these trends in this region of the world for for a longer time will know that it's actually not a new development. I mean, there are deep and longstanding bilateral relations between these new member states from the Middle East and North Africa and their BRICS counterparts. That cooperation has been going on for, for, for a long time on a formal level, kind of government to government, 
firm to firm and even on a more micro level, kind of people to people with investors and migration. Uh, of course, there's also been more formal levels of, of cooperation. Uh, the UAE and Egypt have um, been involved in, uh, in the new development bank, the BRICS lender, uh, for, for a couple of years. So even without being formal members of BRICS, these countries have, uh, and their governments and, and, and business actors, have been looking for ways to uh, play a greater role within this, within this uh, group of countries in this, this block. So my, I guess in conclusion, no, I would say this is not a new trend. It's not a new development, but I don't think that that detracts from the significance of, uh, of the development, the significance of these governments making the step to formally become BRICS members. I do think that's significant. And I wrote more about it in my piece which uh, I, I don't have the time to go to go through in depth here, but I do think it it indicates a strong desire on the part of these countries to to increase not only their economic clout but also their political clout on the global stage, and they see BRICS as an important venue uh, for doing that. By no means the only venue or forum for doing that, but an important one to uh, to consider. A very significant launch pad as well. But the point about this, Dr. Jose Caballero, is that from what Robert has said, it, it, it does appear that given the relationships that were happening between these countries, there was an inevitability that it would be formalized in, in this manner. But the BRICS is about to get even bigger. So how do you see that increased membership actually playing out? And what is it on a very practical level that these new members are bringing to the table? Thank you, Juliet. Um... Yes, as Robert pointed out, this is not a new process, but it is significant uh, in the sense that uh, it highlights the blog's global appeal. Uh, uh, and also, the, it's, it places it as, a re, as an alternative to the current international order. Uh, Dominic discussed the statistics. We have seen uh, global, their global GDP contribution is about 30%. And the population, global population, is about forty-five percent. So, as uh, Robert indicated, this is uh, this is likely to increase their economic and political clout in the inter in international relations, and in the sense that economically, it will increase the um, uh, their enlarge their markets, for example, access to markets. But at the same time, they will increase the uh, purchasing power of their uh, populations. Um, in terms of the uh, political cloud, um, by pursuing, by enabling them to pursue their own interests, uh, the new BRICS, the expanded BRICS, will um, have a greater impact on, on global politics. As to the current challenge, um, you know, there's much talk about the, the, the challenge to the current uh, world order. I, I doubt that it will be a, a, a confrontational, a, you know, direct confrontation with the current uh, uh, powers, but it, it is more likely to be, um, um, uh, you know, a gradual move away from the current uh, institutional framework. For example, mm. in the past, uh, uh, the uh, the old BRICS members um, had some demands about uh, better financial uh, governance uh, in the world, uh, which uh, basically criticized the the uh, the quota and, and, and voting system of the IMF. So uh, the the challenge to the current order is more likely to be in this soft um, area, which is institutional. As to what the new bring, uh, what the new members bring, um, they bring economic dynamism. For example, uh, if we look at Ethiopia. It was one of the uh, fastest growing uh, or more dynamic uh, uh, economies in the world in, the, in recent times. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 and, and, and regional conflicts halted its, its growth. Um, there is also, uh, in the context of China's current uh, issues with population decline, uh, in, in terms of how that will affect uh, labor supply, uh, it is important to note that the uh, new members bring in younger labor markets. Uh, for so, example. so those are those are amongst the competitive strengths because you, you talk there about youth. Yes, and this is, is very important because yes, this certainly is, this is key. Uh, 
uh, because, uh, uh, as I said, it, it is we have to consider that in the context of China's uh, current. Uh, it, it has been a continuous decline of of uh, a, a continuous uh, aging of the population, and at the same time, uh, a lower uh, birth rate. So mm. that it is very likely that will affect the uh, uh, labor market, the Chinese labor market. And this new group of, of, of um, um, members, BRIC members, bring in younger markets, labor markets. So we have uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, UAE, and Brazil also has a, a very low dependency ratio, uh, which means uh, you know, the uh, young and old uh, um, uh, segments of the population depend less on the working population. So um, I think it's the two main characteristics that the uh, or main aspects that uh, we can highlight about what they bring. OK, Let, let's follow on from that, Andrew, because I mean, as we as we've heard, this is this is a, a new coupling. It's dynamic. There's political significance, although clearly they're going to be very careful how they use that power. But again, one of the key advantages that they have is this youthful population, people who are hungry to make their mark on the world. But I mean, what is driving the increasing growth of wealth in the wealthiest of the BRIC countries, because yes, the coupling looks great, but economically, they've all got different stories to tell, and certainly wealth-wise. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, quite a lot of the BRICS countries have quite a lot of uh, economic and social issues. Um, the, the one sort of standing light, I'd say, of the BRICS is probably the UAE, which is obviously a new entrant, uh, both in terms of wealth per capita, it's one of the got one of the highest wealth per capita, uh, probably in the top 20, top 30 in the world. Um, it's um, also one of the fastest growing uh, wealth markets in the world in terms of wealth growth, wealth per capita growth, and in terms of high net worth growth. So um, I think that's probably the shining light. Um, China and India, obviously, uh, they um, together constitute around 30, 35% of the world's total population. So, so the fact that they they relatively have a relatively large number of high net worth shouldn't really be a surprise. Um, I think uh, if you if you look at the number of high net worth in China, if you actually look at it as we do based on liquid uh, liquid uh, wealth, um, there are just over eight hundred and sixty thousand, which compares to the United States that has almost six million. So although China's GDP is quite similar. To the United States, when you actually look at it in terms of liquid wealth, they're, they're way behind. And, and so, um, and also their wealth per capita in China is still quite low. It's about 20,000 US dollars per person, uh, which is quite a lot lower than the UAE. Um, and the United States is around $200,000 per person. So, so um, I would say, yeah, in answer to your question, the UAE is, is probably. Um, uh, the one that that you could look at as as having a lot of positives. Mm. Well, in actual fact, that's what I want to do next, and, and I want to look at the UAE in a little bit more detail with you, Sunita Singh Dalal, because look, we've been hearing how the the UAE is the real shining star here, but how has it been leading the way in the area of investment migration, and how do you think the UAE's membership of BRICS is going to impact investment migration in the wider Middle East area? Is it going to supercharge it? That's an interesting phrase, Juliet. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, look, the, the UAE undoubtedly um, in the run up, um, even before the world witnessed the global pandemic, um, was set on a very clear trajectory in terms of attracting talent and encouraging business and investment um, to the region. Um, the UAE has always tried to retain a very neutral, harmonious stance um, and in, within the region. And in fact, interestingly, in 2022 alone, the UAE um, attracted almost 4,000 um, high net worth uh, individuals to, to the region. And that figure alone in a two-year period is reflective of a 208% increase. Um, the, the, the UAE alone is actually very, very reliant on the input and contribution that is made by such individuals seeking to come to, to the country. Um, we then had, during the pandemic, the very innovative um, creation of what we know to be the golden visa, 
Um, and I think one of the attractions and one of the reasons why the UAE retains um, a lot of uh, uh, attraction to people seeking to look um, to relocate for a better quality of life or whether it's in terms of business opportunity or to, to capitalize on the vibrant ecosystem we've set up here being an international financial center is that it is incredibly easy to do so. Um, it is not, uh, no disrespect to a lot of the other countries that are offering investment migration options, but it's not a convoluted process. So it's not prohibitive, provided you do meet the criteria, and provided you're able to demonstrate that you can contribute in a manner that is meaningful and, and certainly needed. We're very blessed to be here. We live in a very peaceful environment um, and the economy is absolutely booming. We've seen since the um, introduction of BRICS, since the advent of our membership of BRICS, we've seen yet another category of visa opportunity that's been um, um, opened up to others. In, in fact, with the threshold, the financial thresholds are much lower. And interesting, we will see with the advent of some of the Middle Eastern countries joining uh, BRICS and, and of course also remembering in terms of G20 membership as well, which is very, mm. very, very interesting and strategic in terms of where we are as a nation. Um, we, we certainly will uh, start to see a lot more competition internally within the Middle Eastern region as well. Um, and again, competition is very healthy. Uh, and what this is doing is allowing um, international investors, professionals, people, as I said, who genuinely can contribute to society in a very positive way, which is what we need in the Middle East to maintain the stability that we have in the UAE, for example. Um, and we will see um, a, a, con a continual increase of such people coming in and investors coming in. OK, so exciting times lying ahead. But then let's take the other side of that coin, Robert, because, look, we've been focusing there on the UAE. But what about the MENA region? How is it likely to move forward on in terms of economic collaboration? And which areas perhaps pose or present the greatest economic opportunities within that newly expanded BRICS grouping? If I could ask you to be brief as well, because there are a few more questions I'd like to put to the panel as well. Sure, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I can think of a couple of key areas for, for economic cooperation. Uh, the first is obviously energy. In that new group, you have major uh, energy producers and major energy consumers. I mean, the big producers, obviously, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iran, uh, Russia, I, I mean, Brazil to some extent, um, also engaging more with OPEC plus, all of those countries, I mean, engaging um, in global energy markets uh, and looking at the other BRICS members uh, that are major consumers of energy commodities, uh, China, India uh, in particular. So there's a lot of room for energy uh, cooperation. I think on the, on the finance and investment side too, we'll see a lot more, uh, many more initiatives, joint investment initiatives on the sovereign wealth fund level. I mean, there are trillions of dollars of sovereign wealth in um, in Gulf countries, in particular uh, in, in the UAE and also in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but we also see sovereign wealth funds in China, uh, Russia, very active. There are longstanding joint investment platforms. I think that they've started from a very modest level, and there's a lot of room to grow those partnerships. Um, of course, we'll see other investments across key sectors uh, of the economy. Tech is a big focus, EVs, um, you know, the, these are just to name a, a few where I can see telecoms as well, there being a lot of room for investments. Uh, tourism is, is another area. If you look at what's going on in, in Saudi Arabia, the UAE is an established tourism hub. Um, many of those on the panel will know that, but, but there's a major focus on tourism uh, initiatives in Saudi Arabia. And the key insight here is that a lot of these tourism initiatives have a strong luxury focus. And they are attracting and looking for a supply of, of international tourists um, that are able to take advantage of a kind of niche luxury uh, offering. So, and, and they're going to find that based on um, the presentation we got, they're going to find a, a, a steady supply of that 
uh, demographic of tourists coming from BRICS countries. Uh, and finally, the, the, wealth, uh, the wealth migration front, which uh, Henley and Partners knows very well here. Uh, high net worth individuals are absolutely paramount to the economic development trajectories that a number of Middle Eastern countries, in particular the UAE and Saudi Arabia, have embarked upon. They need that influx of high net worth individuals um, to support and reinforce the economic policy decisions that they've made over the past couple of years, and to my mind, will continue to make over the coming years. Yeah, and I'm glad, in fact, that you touched on, on Saudi Arabia, because that's that's a country or a kingdom I'd, I'd like to discuss with, with you, Sunita, because, look, so much is happening in the kingdom, which is certainly shifting the traditional Western perception of how it's how it's looked at, what is happening, the innovation, et cetera, which is going on there. I don't want to talk about the politics because that's for, for another time with somebody else. But look, just mm -hmm. explain to those who perhaps are not aware of what is happening in the kingdom. And more importantly, I want you to put it in a context, okay? How unprecedented are these changes? I, th I think it's it's a given, um, as you said, notwithstanding political sensitivities, that Saudi Arabia is um, reincarnated, it's reincarnating itself in a very, very positive light. There is certainly time to be made up um, and in terms of changes, yes, very unprecedented. Um, we ourselves work across three different locations in Saudi. I travel to Saudi frequently. Um, it is incredibly exciting. The talent pool um, is, is, is so diverse. Um, and what does that mean? So that means in terms of not only professional service providers, professionals like ourselves, um, especially within the financial industry, the advisory industry, um, we are all contributing to enhance the ecosystem of Saudi Arabia. Um, and almost, as I said, making up for lost time. Coupled with that, following the uh, membership of BRICS and, and some of the other strategic global groupings that we've seen, um, Saudi, of course, um, itself is very keen to develop rapidly its infrastructure, um, and that itself presents a lot of investment opportunity for international players. I foresee that with the membership of BRICS, even within the BRICS community itself, we're going to see a lot of movement of, um, of key infrastructure development companies um, and of uh, multinational companies seeking to set up in, in Saudi. I, as I said, work very um, actively on the ground in Saudi, and we advise many, many Saudi families, and it is definitely a two-way flow. So it's not just a question of people inbound um, to Saudi looking to, to kind of um, exploit some of the opportunities, take advantage of some of the benefits, the tax incentives that are given to multinational companies seeking to relocate regional headquarters to Saudi Arabia. But it is definitely an outbound um, set of activities that we're beginning to see as well. We're seeing trends, um, as, uh, as Robert mentioned, in terms of sovereign wealth funds, for example, looking to on the back of the G20 meet in India recently, we saw the Saudi sovereign wealth funds signing up um, tremendous amounts of uh, cooperative economic um, bilateral agreements, enhancing trade, looking at, for example, Prime Minister Modi's gift city to set up sovereign wealth funds as a gateway to invest further into India. Um, as recently as this morning, I was reading about the significant investment made by not just Saudi, but also by Mubadla in healthcare, Manipal hospitals. There is so much going on that's actually getting to the heart of these countries within the BRICS communities at grassroots level that we see everyone will definitely benefit. Sure, and it's a process of time. Yeah, and it's a process of filtration as well, because what is happening in one part of the, of the BRICS company will perhaps spur on those elsewhere and again, enhancing the attractiveness to the wider investment community. And you come into the conversation because, look, going back to that presentation we saw at the very beginning from Dominic, he pointed out that you've got China having five of the top 10 wealthiest cities within that BRIC grouping. But I'd like to get your take on that list in terms of their growth and perhaps the future wealth hubs, which in your opinion, within the block, we ought to be keeping an eye on, even if they're quiet now, at some point, they're going to really punch through the sky, aren't they? 
Yes, yeah. So uh, yeah, just looking at that top 10 list of the 10 wealthiest cities, the BRICS, Beijing, Shanghai, obviously on top. I don't think there's any big surprises there. Dubai in third, uh, uh, partic particularly high number of high net worths. Uh, Mumbai in fourth. Uh, Mumbai's got a large amount of billionaires and centi millionaires, um, but in terms of high net worths, it's behind Dubai. Uh, and then Shenzhen is really the standout in terms of growth. Obviously, it's home to uh, many of the biggest uh, tech companies in the BRICS. Most of the biggest tech companies in the BRICS are based in Shenzhen. Um, so uh, we expect also strong growth from them going forward. Hangzhou. Which of course the base city for Alibaba um, is quite a scenic city and a lot of high net worths live there. Uh, Delhi is obviously a um, uh, uh, well known city in, in India, capital of India. Um, uh, Moscow is um, Moscow's uh, had a drop in wealth mainly because of some of the problems in Russia, but it's still home to a particularly large number of centi millionaires and billionaires. And Hangzhou. Uh, is another Chinese city. And then, of course, Abu Dhabi, uh, Abu Dhabi um, which rounds out the top 10, uh, also is home to a lot of wealthy people. It has a lot of um, very fancy houses and residential estates in that area. Um, and, and in terms of your question regarding the, the future wealth hubs, uh, we did look at that in, in the report. We highlighted five cities in particular uh, that didn't make the top 10. Uh, but we're expecting really strong growth for um, there's there's an article on, on on the on the report called BRICS Wealth Hubs of the Future and yeah the five cities we we highlighted were Riyadh in Saudi Arabia which just missed out on the top ten um, it was in eleventh but we're expecting the number of high net worths to double there um, it's obviously the um, the base city for the Saudi stock market which is the twelfth largest stock market in the world. And the public investment fund is based there, um, and then um, probably the standout on in terms of growth going forward, we're expecting to be Bangalore. Um, so we're expecting very strong wealth growth from Bangalore. It's obviously it's been nicknamed the Silicon Valley of India uh, because it's it's uh, the base city for many big uh, tech giants, and uh, we're expecting very strong growth from them going forward. Jeddah, which is another. Saudi city. We're expecting strong growth from them. It's, it's located quite close to Mecca, and it's always been home to a large number of wealthy Saudi families, and we're expecting strong growth there. And then Sharjah, which is the, the little brother to Abu Dhabi and Dubai, but actually in terms of wealth growth over the past decade has actually been growing slightly quicker. And um, we're expecting that to continue going forward. And then another city to watch is Cape Town. Cape Town in South Africa, there's, uh, there's been a lot of wealthy people that have been moving to Cape Town, especially from the, from the rest of South Africa, but also from abroad, like from place, from, from the rest of Africa, from Europe, from Russia, from the UK. And we're expecting that to accelerate over the, the next decade. You know, Cape Town is obviously home to many of the world's fanciest residential areas like Bantry Bay, Bishop's Court, and we're expecting it to um, perform very well over the next decade in terms of high net worth and general wealth growth. Okay, so Cape Town is where it's at, and also Riyadh, Bangalore. I can't remember the rest of the, the cities, but it was it was a good spread. That's what I do remember. But again, anybody who wants to know more, I will direct you to the Henley and Partners report. But look, let me bring it back to you, Dominic, because you know we've all been talking about the observations that you presented to us. But you know, how do BRICS member states actually weigh up in terms of their global mobility and the passport power that they have, because you know more about this than me, but from my point of view, it sounds pretty formidable. Yeah, so, so when we talk about passport power, we're really talking about the, the travel freedom that our passport gives us. <clears throat> and so we, we have the, the passport index, of course, which, which ranks 199 passports against their um, uh, access to 227 destinations without the need for a prior visa. Um, and, you know, normally you, you would look at the top 10, and I guess the usual suspects are there, 
in terms of you know a lot of the um, European Union members and the US and the UK. Um, from a BRICS perspective, as I said earlier, the UAE is certainly the the, the highest achiever in that regard. Um, with this UAE passport now, you you can access 183 destinations around the world without a without a prior visa. Um, Brazil sits in 17th place with uh, visa free or visa on arrival access to 173 destinations. But the rest of the BRICS members really sit outside the top 50 um, in the rankings. The UAE, I guess, is probably the, well, it is the standout performer of the Henley Passport Index over the last 10 years, um, where the government here, you know, they made an active decision to strategically move away uh, from the reliance on hydrocarbons. And so the UAE has been extremely successful in going out and uh, negotiating reciprocal visa waiver agreements with a number of countries around the world. And that's seen them over the last decade add 106 new destinations to which citizens of the UAE can access without a visa. And that's seen them move up 44 places. So it's still a bit of work to do for a lot of the other members, um, but it is the visa waiver space is quite an, a dynamic um, uh, place now at the moment. And a lot of countries are looking to increase their global mobility and that's often done through reciprocal agreements mm. uh, one notable one was the UAE and China where you know that that's expected to see significant inflows not only of tourism but also trade and investments into the UAE and so countries can really benefit from these types of initiatives yeah but but how are BRICS investors themselves and business people based in this this grouping actually using that investment migration as a really powerful mechanism for, for gaining greater ease of access to the rest of the world? Because it sounds to me that if you're actually based in, in this BRICS group, that you've it's it's like the key to the golden door, really, that you can pretty much open it with a degree of ease if you're looking to, to expand your horizons beyond the BRICS, the immediate BRICS. Yeah, uh, I, I did see in the, in the Q&A, there was a question, this exact question was there as well around, you know, what are the best options for citizens of these BRICS members in terms of increasing their global and economic mobility. Um, and I, I guess the good news is there, there's actually a lot of options. So within the industry known as investment migration, you have a number of countries around the world that offer re, um, regulated citizenship by investment programs. So if like myself, I was born in South Africa, I have a South African passport, which uh, only gives me access to about 108 countries, but I'm an international businessman and I need to travel a lot um, and visas can be quite a hassle these days. So what I can do if I was a high net worth individual is I can actually partake in these citizenship by investment programs. Um, there's a number in, in the Caribbean. So there's a couple of options um, in the Caribbean that you can invest into the country and in return, as long as you pass the due diligence and of course that you have the financial capacity, you can become a citizen of that country and therefore have the right to get a passport, um, a second passport, or in some cases, an alternative passport. And that then gives me visa-free access to jur jurisdictions like the UK, like Singapore, like Hong Kong, like um, the European Schengen Zone. So through the use of these citizenship by investment programs, I can actually move up the, the passport index and get greater mobility. And that, of course, gives me access to more opportunities, whether they are for a family holiday or probably more importantly, for business reasons. Um, and then in Europe, of course, you also have a number of options in Europe. Um, Malta has a very interesting option to naturalize as a multi-citizen and become an EU um, citizen, essentially. Uh, and there are also a lot of these, what they refer to as golden visas, so residence by investments in Portugal in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, where through an investment into real estate, sometimes it's a venture capital fund, I can get residents of that country. And the beauty of the European options is because they're Schengen members, just by becoming a resident of that country, I have free access to the Schengen zone for at least 90 days, every 180 days. So if I'm a successful entrepreneur or a business promoter sitting in India, as an example, and my suppliers are sitting in Europe, um, just by getting residents of one of these European countries, I can fly in and out much easier in order to grow my empire.
It, it makes it makes good business sense as much as anything. I want to temporarily break off on the discussion as well, just to remind you, our online audience, that we do want you to be involved in the conversation. So please use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit any questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can in the time available at the end of the panel discussion. I'm delighted to say that some of you have been doing just that. So thank you so much. Keep those questions coming in. Robert, let me bring you into the conversation. We've got a few minutes left before we do take audience questions. But you know what? We've been looking at all the positives. We heard about those positives a few moments ago, in fact, from Dominic. But at the same time, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There are challenges and there are also risks, especially confronting MENA countries within this expanded BRICS grouping. So what are the challenges and what are the risks that people need to be aware of? Sure. I, I'd put it another way, too, that, I mean, no no good political economy analysis that doesn't touch on the winners and losers is really worth its weight and salt. Uh, there are a couple a couple of areas I'd um, I'd point to. I, I guess the first is, uh, well, this refers actually to a statement uh, and a, a question that that came through the question answer answer section is um, some of the new members are actually undertaking a process of figuring out uh, themselves what exactly their role within the group is and what it's going to be. I mean, there's um, there is serious consideration and a lot of effort that needs to go into that on the part of, of, of new members or invited members. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a good example there. We uh, spent a considerable amount of time before publication figuring out, at least in my article, the most accurate way to describe Saudi, Ara uh, Saudi Arabia's participation. We had the invitation extended to them last year. Um, like most other invitees, it was the expectation that they would uh, the Saudis would just formally become a BRICS member at the beginning of the year. Uh, then we had some Saudi officials saying that they're still weighing their options. And then more recent reports suggest that, um, like I figured, there's this is um, this will will happen in, in in the near term, and we'll just get the confirmation from official sources from a number of official sources. But all of that is just to say that um, it, it reinforces the idea that BRICS itself is a relatively loose grouping of countries. There, yes, there are formal um, mechanisms and institutional channels for uh, for cooperation, and we discussed some of them today. Um, but it is ultimately going to be upon those members and their governments and the and the business actors uh, to determine how and uh, they're going to get the most out of uh, out of membership. And that's not always going to be easy because within the original BRICS members, you have a real diversity of interests. If you look at China, you look at India, you look at Russia, um, there is not a perfect overlap of, of interest on a government to government level or a business to business level. There's going to be competition. And um, generally speaking, uh, competition in the economic realm is good. But it, like I said in the beginning, it also uh, creates winners and losers. I think you see a similar diversity of interests and a similar diversity of uh, economic positions within the or relative positions within the global uh, uh, economy when we look at the new uh, the newly invited and member um, states of of BRICS. You see countries like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, very strong economies, a lot of economic momentum. You see other countries like Egypt and, and Iran uh, dealing with a very different economic picture and a very different economic trajectory. Um, you know, and 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 the the final point that I'll add is yes, I'd like to underline there are, I believe, a number of new investment opportunities that these formal partnerships um, will uh, will reveal, and in in especially in the Middle East and North Africa, when there is a political will, there usually is an economic way. So. Um, it's a positive sign to see political will and incentive behind these economic partnerships. But I also know from looking at how uh, Middle East and North African countries and officials in these countries have thought about investing uh, in a number of BRICS economies, that they will be the first to tell you there are big challenges investing in China, in investing in India. Um, there are It's a complex regulatory environment. In some cases, it's getting better, but it still is is a challenge uh, for investors. So um, I, I think that there's still a lot of work to be done um, and a lot of conversations to be had, though that will be an easier ask um, when there is this formal membership and those formal channels to work through.
Yeah, and let's follow on from that, Sunita, because look, it's 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 a great opportunity on the one thing on the one hand, but as Robert has pointed out, there are some practical difficulties on the ground. So how is that going to impact those clients, probably people that you yourself are dealing with, who actually want to create cross border estate and succession plans? Because there are the much sort of wider, perhaps geopolitical factors which they have to bear in mind. But on a more organic level, what what else is it that they need to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, completely digressing from the main conversation, but it is very, very important because the the, the issue of succession um, across different uh, member states is going to vary from state to state and sometimes even within a country itself. Look at India, for example, where, for example, the state of Goa has its own inheritance laws and succession laws based on all Portuguese laws. Um, very, very diverse to what you might find in northern India. And likewise, um, what people um, often get very confused with in the Middle East is the four stairship provisions that apply um, to Islamic families, um, which, again, I emphasize apply to Islamic families and not necessarily non-Islamic families if you're based here. And estate and succession planning is incredibly important when we're looking at families who are moving with businesses or key persons within the family who are looking to expand their geographic footprint um, just by way of their involvement, by way of not perhaps having had the proper advice, the pre-arrival planning, now that we've seen the introduction of, for example, in the UAE, corporation tax. Um, and what does that mean? That might mean, for example, if we're looking at a multinational company in the US seeking to take advantage uh, in Saudi Arabia of the tax incentives that they're being offered to set up regional headquarters in Saudi Arabia. But if members of the board are still participating in uh, decisions in Saudi from the US and the entire um, operation there is actually going to be exposed to US taxation. And the same applies at grassroots individual levels, even when we're looking at um, estate planning. So for example, if we're setting up structures to preserve and protect assets um, for families, to preserve the ancestral wealth. If the family members who are taking day-to-day -day decisions, even within the estate planning um, uh, plan itself, are either nationals of a very high tax nation, um, it's very, very critical for us to look at the legal and tax implications, look at how we might benefit um, using the advantages available under double taxation treaties. Um, and likewise, uh, you know, Saudi has its own taxation regime. UAE doesn't have income tax as such. And so even within the GCC, there are certain benefits to be, to be gained. But um, looking at all of this and then looking at, of course, the wealth that we then start to, uh, to build up in some of the new geographies that we're diversifying into. But then who is that wealth? being transmitted to and what are they being, um, you know, are they participants in it? Are they silent beneficiaries? If they are beneficiaries, how do we create structures that, that preserves and protects their interests without too much um, being wilted away with, uh, with fiscal liability? Mm -hmm. so, so it is very, very dynamic and complex, but again, um, perfectly feasible to navigate. Okay, look, thank yeah. you so much. We only have a few more minutes left before we actually take questions from our online audience. So if I can ask the panelists to be brief in your responses, but Andrew, taking it to you, you've heard the practical difficulties on the ground that uh, Sunita has expanded on, but from a wealth creation perspective, what are the key risks that BRICS member states could actually face over the next decade? It probably is um, slightly unfair to ask you to forecast to head to what's gonna happen in 2034, but give it a go, please. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, well, we highlighted some key risks in that article I mentioned earlier on the future wealth, uh, future wealth hubs. Um, and uh, essentially, we see as the key risk to wealth creation is probably the biggest one is the USA's ongoing dominance of the global tech sector, which I think is starting to become a problem for, for most countries uh, that are not the United States. Um, the United States basically controls the world wide web, they control the back office servers of the web, they, they control the big giants like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon web services, they, they, they control the chip makers like Intel and Nvidia. And although there has been some growth in brick based tech companies like Huawei, Infosys, Tencent, ZTE, Alibaba, 
a lot of them are, are basically just filling gaps that the US is not interested in. And, and I think it's going to become increasingly difficult uh, for, for BRICS tech companies to basically get, get a foothold uh, on, on the rest of the world, as we saw with the Huawei 5G debacle. Um, so essentially, I think that's the biggest challenge for the BRICS. Um, of course, another, another big one is the crime and safety aspect. Uh, most of the BRICS nations are, are, rank, are ranked pretty poor, poorly when it comes to murder rates, women's safety, child safety. And they also rank pretty poorly on the Global Peace Index, with the exception of the UAE, probably. Uh, and, and so th th that's a major challenge because uh, uh, wealth growth, long term wealth growth over a 50 year period is often linked to safety. Mm. And uh, if you look at the safest countries in the world, countries like Switzerland, they are the countries with the highest wealth per capita. And I, that's no coincidence. And then another thing that you hear a lot about is that the whole US dollar standard. So there's obviously uh, the US controls a lot of the forex transactions. They have to go through US dollars. And there's been a lot of talk about them starting a BRICS currency. I think may need to get around this. And obviously uh, the Europe tried this with the Euro um, to limit its success. You know, one could say in a huge amount of admin. So that seems an unrealistic uh, thing, but it's something that the BRICS they right. talk about a lot. Yeah, and let me jump in here because in actual fact, one of those questions we've had from our viewers is actually about the BRICS currency. So hopefully all the, the potential for BRICS currency. So we'll try and adjust by the time available. But let me just quickly bring in Jose. I'm conscious of the fact that um, you've, you were there at the beginning of the conversation, but not in the middle. But thank you for your patience nonetheless, because look, what Andrew has outlined are challenges of the future, but they're, they're also current as well, because safety doesn't just pop up in a few years time, it's here now. Also this whole idea about the US technology or the US grip on the tech sector, et cetera, that will be challenged, but how will it be challenged and so on and so forth. But look, what else do you see as the big challenges facing the expanded bricks? So a couple spring to mind in my head, but I'm not the one answering the question, you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think Brover got ahead of me uh, a little bit there. Uh, he talked about the uh, different interests and I think that's uh, challenge number one. Uh, this divergent interest, despite the group or the bloc having a common vision uh, about the uh, a greater role for the global south, the uh, competing interests might have an influence in this common vision. And I think there is a question in, in the chat also about the common objective. Uh, and one of these, it, it might be uh, the greater role of this, the, uh, the global south in international politics. Uh, the second challenge I will mention is uh, um, so far, um, uh, the 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 block has functioned in, in a very complicated consensus based approach and bringing in a, a diversity of of new members might impact this uh, ability uh, to build consensus uh, i suppose that is related to divergent interest also um, another um, um, challenge in in robert mentioned losers uh, there might be a, a dilution of influence. For example, in the case of Brazil, say, or South Africa, uh, bringing in new members might uh, have an impact on, on uh, how they develop common external positions. And in these countries with relatively less economic uh, uh, clout may lose some of the influence within the bloc. Um, and uh, Robert also mentioned uh, this way of, uh, uh, of the bloc functioning in a loose manner. So uh, I see uh, a, a challenge of institu institutionalization, uh, creating a, a, an institution uh, uh, with given processes that can challenge the, uh, that can be an alternative to the current institutional framework. Um, and finally, um, uh, I will say that the, uh, the, the nature of the block has turned uh, geopolitical, the character of the block. Um, and they're aiming to challenge the uh, global order. And in this sense, this ambition can lead to some conflicts with the established powers and institutions. So um, there might be some risk in, in, in the expansion, but uh, like I said in the beginning, some of the uh, competitiveness uh, um, uh, value 
added uh, may have a, 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 a positive impact in the, in the short to uh, midterm. Okay. Dominic, I want you to close out the panel discussion with some brief responses to, the, to my question here before we actually go on to the question from our other questions from our online audience. But look, you yeah, know, we've heard so much in our time together, the positives and the, the big challenges, some of which, for better or for worse, are, are geopolitical. But there is a growing trend of building a portfolio of residence and citizenship options. You discussed that yourself. So are there any specific investment migration programs that BRICS citizens are favoring? Because whatever they have to choose, they're gonna be very clever because you're not just dealing with, with current issues, it's also looking to the future as well. So it's balancing the two points. Yeah, I, th I think if you look at the, the BRICS members, it's clear there are significant opportunities for wealth creation and, um, you know, starting and, and growing a business, but there are also significant challenges. And so I think any wealthy person, and it's not even, you know, necessarily limited to BRICS members, but any wealthy person these days needs to have options. I think optionality is, is probably the, the key term at the forefront of most of their minds. Uh, and in terms of their wealth planning and family planning. So we see, particularly out of the BRICS nations, those that are you know, at the millionaire, centi-millionaire level are developing a portfolio and, and not a, you know, of residence and citizenship or domiciles around the world, um, where they're not only diversifying you know, what they invested into, but also where they can live, whether it's you know, short-term or medium-term. So if you look at what's most popular, you know, more direct to your question, Certainly, we see a lot of um, a lot of clients from these regions look to get citizenship from you know one of the Caribbean um, Commonwealth countries, Grenada or Antigua and Barbuda. Next to that, they usually like to have some sort of a foothold in Europe through either you know Malta or one of the golden visas in Portugal, Greece or Spain. Part of that equation is very much a UAE golden visa, and, and here as well, there's options in Ras Al Khaimah, in Abu Dhabi, and in, in Dubai itself. Um, Saudi has also introduced, you know, their own sort of residence by investment options. And then, you know, you also have those that really plan for the most unforeseen circumstances that would look at, you know, potentially having one of the investor visas available as far away in, in New Zealand, right? So that's as far away from any potential global event. But the idea is that I have four or five jurisdictions at my disposal and I, and I build that portfolio by participating in these investment migration programs. Okay, Dominic, thank you so much for that. Now, we are gonna take questions from our audience. My advice to the panel is take a deep breath, exhale, relax. Before we do start answering those questions, I don't do hesitation on my panels. I'm gonna put a question out there. If nobody takes it immediately, I am going to choose the person to answer. So now that we've got that straight panel, are you ready? Fantastic. Let's go for it. Now, in actual fact, Andrew, I want you to tackle this question because you actually touched on it in one of your responses. But it says, what will be the impact of the USD and euro if the BRICS does a new currency? OK, they may not be mooting the idea now, but you know, if they can actually look at the European experience of the single currency and um, learn from the ups and downs and mistakes, etc. What would be the impact if the BRICS went for it? Well, it depends what they mean by a single currency. If they mean doing what the euro did and completely scrapping their existing currencies and, 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 and doing that, I, I would imagine there'd be massive risks to doing that. You saw it happen in Greece, although the economy has recovered now, but I think a lot of their problems were associated with joining the euro in the beginning. I, it, it's, it's a very risky thing to do. It would, it would, it would uh, more than likely create havoc. Um, but another option would be to just have some kind of reserve currency on the side, um, more like the gold standard or the US dollar standard, which is probably more what they what they mean when they are in practicality. Um, but but I, I, I would imagine the risks of doing it are even even there are much greater than the potential benefit. Uh, I think I think uh, the world had a go at replacing the dollar with the euro. It didn't work, and I think that was probably 
the end of the road for that idea. Okay, so the and advice of the the advice of the expert here is is don't do it. And judging from the nodding that I saw from other members of the panel, I don't think you're likely to get much disagreement on that. But I look, could just I, yeah, I could jump in if you don't mind. I, I share Andrew's skepticism. I think we saw this being a a, a unifying theme of the summit last year. Not a, a whole lot of traction. I, is it significant in a geopolitical sense that? This newly expanding, at the time now expanded group is 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 making this a part of of the agenda. Yes, but there are big challenges there. Uh, you know how China, Russia, and in Iran think about a um, alternate system of global finance is different than how India thinks about it and what they want to achieve through it. Um, it's also important to note that Saudi Arabia and the UAE, these countries peg their uh, their currencies. To the dollar, so um, it's also going to that's going to factor into their into their considerations as well uh, on this kind of uh, agenda point. So, um, yeah, lots of challenges ahead in in creating that uh, alternate global financial system. I think what we can say though is at this moment in time, it's certainly not a priority. But look, let's move on to another question which has come through to us from Palm Beach in Florida. Do BRICS countries have a common goal or route? towards the creation of a sustainable future? And what are the trends? Great question. Who would like to tackle that one, please? Nobody by the looks of it. Well, would you I, like to? I, I can. Um, I mean, we, we recently in the UA hosted uh, COP28, of course, and I, I did share, I think, the benefit of Henley um, writing about some of the sustainability objectives and goals. And as part of that research, what was very clear is that there is an overlap between some of the BRICS member states um, uh, across in terms of common goals of sustainability um, and uh, various investments that will also tick the boxes of um, you know contributing to creating a more greener environment for us all. Now whether um, whether BRICS itself is going to actually highlight or has highlighted to date um, initiatives or incentives or actual you know marked out goals. I, I think at the moment it's a bit too premature. However, I certainly foresee, given um, the UAE and Saudi's uh, commitment to sustainable, um, creating a more sustainable environment, especially as Robert was pointing out earlier, we are responsible for some of the significant energy production globally. Um, I do see that sustainability is going to be something that is of focus. Okay, without let, doubt. let me stick. Let, let, let me, I'm sorry to jump in there because I'm conscious of that. We've got about four minutes left, but look, let's stay with that issue of sustainability, climate change. We've got a question here. Is there a risk that climate change could damage the BRICS economic trends in the coming decades? Because for some of the members, they are more exposed to heating, flooding, et cetera, than others. Could I get a take on that, please, before I move on to some other questions as well? If you'd like to tackle that one. Could climate change effectively derail the BRICS? Robert? I do think climate change- Oh, sorry, Sunita, so and then uh, Robert. Sorry. Yeah. Senator, please do continue. No, I, I was just going to say again, because the research and the analysis that I've done in both that, that overlies in both, you know, kind of sustainability and what our goals are here, and especially in terms of BRICS, I didn't see climate change damaging um, the BRICS uh, grouping at all. If anything, I see it being um, a catalytic factor for us to focus or perhaps refocus, not just on materialistic and financial prosperity, but as I said, contributing significantly to make a difference to, to climate change. Okay. Um, and certainly I know for a fact in the Middle East, Saudi and UAE, you know, these are topics that are very, very um, high on our agendas here. Okay, uh, Robert, did you want to add to that at all before I move on to another question from our audience? Yeah, just briefly to say, we are absolutely seeing kind of climate related concerns and environmental concerns registering high on the list, especially in Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and I think the fact that COP28 uh, was uh, held in, in the UAE and then before that um, in Egypt highlights the fact that that actually a number of Middle East and North African countries um, are going to be, you know, like, like many countries around the world are going to be heavily impacted by, um, you know, you know, by uh, by climate change, especially on in terms of heat indices and the like. I think that the big takeaway is that all of these, um, I think the the environmental concerns and climate concerns are a unifying theme that that impact all countries. Uh, it's probably the one area that there's no doubt all, all countries 
can uh, can and should agree on, but it's also going to be one of the hardest to to create international collaboration uh, and and move forward on. And, and we do see some initiatives in the Middle East trying to do that at a regional level and then and then move beyond it. Um, but and we'll have to watch that closely. Okay, then let's see if, if, we I, can, if, uh, I, if I may go add. For it. Go for it. Uh, yes, as uh, Robert said, this is a unifying point. I agree with that. But it also the impact of the environment or the climate change might be depending on the country, on the um, um, condition of their economy. So, for example, in the beginning, I mentioned that Ethiopia was one of the uh, more dynamic economies uh, in the last decade or so. And one of the uh, um, factors that have reduced that growth has been climate change. Uh, for other members of the, uh, the BRICS, for example, climate change might be an opportunity. Uh, we see in competitiveness analysis that India has uh, turned into the development of uh, environment-related technologies. So um, I, in, in my opinion is that this impact will depend on, this, on the state of uh, the country's economy. Okay, then we do have a few more minutes. Okay, so let's if we can if I can ask the panel to keep their answers brief, just so that we can squeeze in a few more questions. Do you see the BRICS alliance posing a serious threat to Western influence or dominance by the end of the decade moving into the 2030s? And the other point which they've made in this question, does does a BRICS alliance actually need more time to mature and formally structure itself before it reaches that point where I guess it could be seen or construed as a threat? Who would like to take that one? And whoever takes it again, can I ask you to be brief in your response? I, I can take that one. Please, thank you. Okay. Um, as in a way the, of a challenge, I doubt that it would be uh, um, soon. And I doubt that it would be, uh, like I said in the beginning, a confrontation, direct confrontation with the current order. It might take, uh, uh, like I said, an institutional challenge walking away from certain um, treaties, for example, within the UN, the IMF, et cetera. Um, um, in, in terms of the second question, I think Robin and I discussed this uh, lack of inst institutionalization of, of processes within the BRICS. And yes, indeed, they need time to mature uh, before, for example, the next wave of membership that has been discussed in the press. OK, can I throw this question out to all of you? In some respects, it, it follows on from the question that Jose has just answered. But what are the chances of implosion, given the issues between some of the members, e.g. India-China border issues? Who would like to tackle that one? Uh, well, okay. yeah, um, well, I, I mean, in terms of India-China border, that's um, that. That's not the one that sort of springs to mind. I would imagine the the ongoing sanctions against Russia and Iran could become an issue. Um, if you look at what happened to Huawei, the past, uh, I mean, I know the United States said it was because of Iran, but I think it was largely because it was a competitor and they didn't want them controlling the back office servers of all the um, of all the mobile internet users. So, so they 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 obviously. Uh, got Europe, Australia, the UK, and themselves and Canada basically, in a sense, shut them down. And Huawei basically mainly operates as a mobile uh, phone maker, and, and, and obviously they make uh, computers. Um, but their 5G uh, infrastructure was damaged. And, and if you look at that, um, they, they could perhaps start tying that. The West could start tying, uh, you know, a BRICS tech companies to the to Russia and Iran in terms of sanctions, and they could start putting more and more pressure and they could essentially use the BRICS as a way to basically leverage China and, and pressure China to do what they want. And, and, and in so doing, they could effectively destroy the whole of the BRICS as, as a formation, because if China pulls out of the BRICS, then the BRICS would probably fall away. So that, that's, that's a real risk. And, and I think that's why having Russia and, and Iran in the BRICS is a, is a big risk. Sure. Would anyone else like to add to that before I take one more question from which we can actually close out? No? Well, OK. I just sorry, think the please loose, don't, go for I'm it. sorry to okay. interrupt, but just the loose nature of the grouping makes it less likely that there's going to be any kind of, I mean, the word was implosion or any kind of yeah. you know, uh, catastrophic conflict. If you have a loose organization and it remains that way for the time being, that gives you some uh, room to maneuver and to manage various conflicts of interest and any any other developments that might that might arise. 
Okay, thank you so much for that. One final question, and then we will close out this panel discussion and the Q&A session. Can you talk a little bit about the role of New Development Bank and how companies can benefit from NDB support and investments, especially regarding infrastructure and sustainable development projects in BRICS and other EMDCs? Who would like to tackle that one very briefly, please? Dominic or, or, or Dr. Robert? I can try to take a stab, although I, I will preface this by saying I'm, I'm not an expert of uh, on the bank itself, but I think we'll see certain um, member countries being expected to play a role as is essentially sponsors and in investors in the bank. I mean, bringing their substantial um, financial clout and and holdings to bear to to basically support and and prop up the bank's clout. On the one hand, we could expect that role to be um, filled or potentially played by. Um, by countries like the UAE. There are other countries that would be looking to be on the receiving end of that of the bank's activity. So looking for preferential financing, um, we could expect Egypt to, to be very much be hoping to, uh, to play that role. We've also seen a lot of collaborations between Chinese companies, for example, Gulf countries um, in investing in uh, in third countries, so investing, say, in renewable energy projects in Central Asia. So we might also see the uh, the the BRICS lender helping to support this collaborative investments between BRICS countries, not just in each other's economies, but actually in third uh, third country economies in other parts of the globe that that aren't yet uh, formally part of uh, of the BRICS. OK, would anyone else like to add to that before I formally close out this session? No. OK, well, look, thank you so much, because there we have to leave it. I'd like to extend my gratitude, in fact, to the panel, because it was a great conversation. And I think it's fair to say as well that the questions from our online audience were pretty darn good. They kept you all thinking. That's what it's all about, thinking on your toes and coming up with the right answer under pressure. And apologies as well to our audience because so many questions came through. I, I am sorry that we weren't able to get through them, but I hope that um, what you've heard will satisfy your curiosity. Don't forget as well that you can also refer to that BRICS Wealth Report, which was published by Henley and Partners. You had an overview at the very beginning. I've actually looked at the report. There is a lot of deep diving, so please, Go in there and check it out. I'm sure that you'll find many of your questions will be answered. But there we will have to leave it. We appreciate your interest and engagement. Enjoy the rest of the day and we will see you again in the not too distant future.